Thank you. This morning, I want to talk about book publishing, particularly academic book publishing, a field in which many wise people are asking whether there is a future. I submit that the state of academic publishing today looks something like this. It is on a trajectory that is not headed for a happy end. And in order to understand how we got to this point, I would like you to join me in an imaginative exercise for a minute. Imagine that you are a university professor. Let's say that you're a biology professor. And let's say that you have just done some groundbreaking research on cytotoxicity. Let's think for a minute about how you finance this work. You received money from your university that paid for your office. You received money that paid for your salary. The university financed your lab. And let's also say that you received money from the National Institutes of Health, a major grant that helped pay for your expenses. Now, who really paid for this? These institutions are simply intermediaries. In reality, the funds from your university came from student tuition dollars. They came from alumni and other donors. And of course, a good deal of money came from US taxpayers. These are the same people who funded the National Institutes of Health, which gave you money. Now, let's imagine as well that this research is so important that it was accepted for publication in one of the main journals in your field, Bioorganic and Medicinal Chemistry Letters, a well-known journal published by the Dutch conglomerate Elsevier. Hooray, this is great news. It's going to stand you in good stead in your future and with tenure and promotion committees. But let's ask, what is the transaction that happens between you and between Elsevier when Elsevier offers to publish this for you? What does Elsevier pay you? Absolutely nothing. In fact, Elsevier demands that you give your article to Elsevier free as a gift without any compensation. So what does Elsevier pay your institution, your university? Again, absolutely nothing. In fact, Elsevier demands that your institution give Elsevier even more money so that they can sell back that research to your university in the form of an of a academic journal. And in this case, at $24,000 a year for this single journal subscription. That's more than a Honda Civic. I think we can agree that this model is ludicrous. You could not design a crazier system if you tried. But wait, it gets even worse. That $24,000 figure is not static. In fact, it is going up every year at quite a rapid rate. Since 1986, the consumer price index, general inflation, represented as the green line here, has increased by about 100%. In contrast, the price of academic cereals has gone up by almost 400%, a ridiculous rate, and university and library budgets cannot hope to keep pace with this. Why is this happening? Why such inflation? It's simply because a few major commercial publishers have achieved monopoly status in their fields. Publishers like Wiley, Elsevier, and Springer have cornered the market in a number of disciplines and subdisciplines. And we know from economics that when you corner the market in a field, you can charge with impunity whatever prices you wish in that market. And this is what is happening now. Which brings us back to books. What is the effect of this system on book acquisitions? Libraries spending more and more of their budgets on these outrageously priced serials buy fewer and fewer books every year. Back in 1986, libraries spent about 44% of their budgets on books. By 2011, that figure had fallen to 22%. If we look at the top 80 liberal arts colleges in the country, back in 2003, 2004, they were buying on average about 7,700 books per year. By 2011, 2012, that had fallen to about 5,100 books a year. This has had an incredible negative effect on good university presses. They are suffering dramatically. Cambridge University Press has been forced to cancel its French studies series. They couldn't sell enough books to make a go of it in French studies. 
Oxford University Press has canceled its contemporary poetry series, could no longer sell enough poetry to, make a, to keep going. Cambridge University Press, back in 1980, published between 3,500 and 5,500 copies of each title. By 2008, that number had fallen to 500 copies per title. And in fact, a, uh, a study that just came out this year indicates that the average number of sales per academic book today has fallen to 200 copies per book. It's gotten to the point where the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation has begun to identify underserved fields, fields in which authors no longer have enough good venues to publish their wares, Slavic studies, American literature, South Asian studies, and ethnomusicology. Since 1993, some 56 disciplines have lost presses. To take just one example, British literature has seen a drop almost in half of the number of presses serving the discipline. University presses are in pretty bad shape. A few are barely alive. LSU and Missouri have experienced near-death experiences recently. Other presses have died, kaput, they're gone. So what is the effect on authors looking to publish their manuscripts? Well, the vultures are circling. And by vultures, I mean disreputable presses. Presses that are ready to snap up manuscripts that used to go to good university presses. Now, what do we mean when we say disreputable publishers? What's the difference between a good press and a bad press? It's pretty simple. A good press is committed to making the best possible product out of manuscripts it receives. Working with the author to question arguments, clarify arguments, massage prose, focus, trim, edit. A bad press, on the other hand, usually takes whatever it receives and with minimal to no editing, slaps it between two covers and publishes the result, often at exorbitant prices. The result, not surprisingly, often stinks. But press, excuse me, but authors, nevertheless, throw their lot in with these presses because they have no other choice, no other outlet. Now, I want to pause for a minute here. The problems I have just described are problems of the developed world, problems of a small portion of the global community. Let's think for a minute about the rest of the world, the developing world, which would be happy to have the problems I just described. And to understand the situation of academic publishing in the developing world, I want to give three examples. This is a book widely recognized as the most important study on the phonology of Mongolian. As far as I can determine, the National Library of Mongolia does not own this book. Stillwaters in Niger. There is only one public university in Niger that could purchase this book. Arguably the most important study of Yemeni politics costs $22. The average weekly wage in Yemen is $35. Almost nobody in the country could afford to purchase this book. So in a nutshell, where are we? University presses are dying. Budgets for anything other than expensive journals are plummeting. As a result, Libraries are purchasing fewer and fewer books. Entire disciplines in the humanities find themselves underserved. And the rest of the world, the rest of the global community, has fallen almost entirely off of our mental map. So what are we going to do? We have to do many things, all of them difficult. One of those is university professors and academics have to pledge themselves not to sign away exclusive control to their work to for-profit publishers. They should resolve to make their work open access. And resolutions at universities in the US and in Europe and in Australia and elsewhere have started to pass these resolutions. We have to support legislation that demands that researchers who receive funding from state and federal institutions make the results of that information freely available. Legislation like this has already passed Congress 
There is more legislation in the House and the Senate right now that we should be throwing our weight behind. We have to acknowledge that some presses have achieved monopolistic power and therefore are in violation of antitrust statutes. And we have to find lawyers willing to mount lawsuits against these publishers and practices. And libraries and academics have to summon the courage to mount boycotts of publishers and practices that are killing us. But even with all of these actions, we still find ourselves enmeshed in a machinery that is preposterous and at root unproductive and harmful. We have to figure out a new system for circulating scholarly information, a system with an entirely new heart. So here's how I propose to do this. We first ask ourselves, what is the purpose of a university press? It's to make good literature available as widely as possible. And how are we doing on that front? Pretty poorly. What is the purpose of an academic library? It is to make good information as widely available as possible. How are we doing? Pretty poorly. So we could ask ourselves, what would happen if we combine these two, put them under one roof, and use the resources of the library to help the press? In other words, said, library, take some of the money you're spending on these outrageously priced materials, give that money to the press, and in return, ask the press to make its publications freely available. In fact, this has already been done at the University of Michigan. This is an inspiring example and we at my institution have asked ourselves, is this something that will only work at a major research university or could it happen at a smaller institution like Amherst? The problem at Amherst, where we want to do this, is we don't have a press with which we could merge. So we have decided that we are going to create one. And this press is going to follow a few simple principles. Everything it publishes will be available free of charge, open access, no fees to anybody who can reach it through the internet. Therefore, everything it publishes will be available through a Creative Commons license, allowing people to download it at will and to share it at will. We're going to very, work very hard to collect the best possible manuscripts we have. We're going to send those out for peer review, ask experts in the field to pass judgment on them before we decide whether we are going to publish them. And then we're going to edit the daylights out of them, like so few commercial presses are now doing. We're going to insist that all of our work have complete credibility with the professoriate and tenure and promotion committees. So the question, of course, is how do we pay for this if we're making it freely available? Our model is pretty simple. The Amherst College Library is going to give to the Amherst College Press two positions that we've held open following retirements. And the press is going to turn these positions into editorial positions, hiring two editors who will solicit the best possible manuscripts and edit them. In return, our president has charged our advancement office with raising money for an endowment, which will be used to fund a director. So we'll have a three-person operation here. In addition, the library is going to take a little bit of existing money, some existing endowed funds, and it will use that money to pay freelance copy editors to work on manuscripts after we've done developmental editing in-house. Other members of the community are going to jump in. Public Affairs Office is going to help us with design. Our information technology people are going to help us build a platform for creating and disseminating this information. So what is the effect of our little ant of a venture on the face of academic publishing? How will our little operation affect the entire universe of scholarly information? The simple answer is, is it won't if it remains an entity unto itself, the only operation engaged in this um, work. But it's not. Other universities are beginning to create freely available information. And this means that my institution is now beginning to receive free information. A small bit of what it used to purchase, it now receives free of charge. Now, these savings do not offset the money we're investing in the press. We're going to pay a lot more in our press than we're receiving free of charge. But one can imagine a state in which many institutions who begin to receive a great deal of free information 
are going to accumulate to the point at which we reach a tipping point, a point at which other institutions can begin to create university presses out of the savings they're realizing by receiving free information. And at that point, we are not only making material freely available to the world, we're saving ourselves money. So in summary, this is the world we're in now. A map of discrete, isolated, autonomous institutions looking out for themselves and doing a very poor job of looking out for themselves. I want to see a world like this in which information is flowing freely. I want a world in which students in Kenya have the same access to good information as students at Cornell University. Where somebody living in a shack on a Pacific island whose one luxury might be a satellite dish has the same access to information as students at Stanford University. Where students in wealthy universe, excuse me, where students in wealthy suburbs in the United States have nothing over the next generation of students in the developing world. This, in other words, is the world in which I want to work. Thank you. <laughs>